Good morning. Please join me in the flag salute and a moment of silence. <clears throat> salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. We're going to start this morning with an update on the 2007 Tulare County Winter Freeze and uh, Kristen Bennett. Good morning, Kristen Bennett, County Administrative Office. This morning we have um, several reports for you on the status of the winter freeze and we're also asking you to reaffirm the declaration of the state of emergency. Uh, first up, uh, Agricultural Commissioner Gary Kunkel will provide a farm and crop report for you and then Donnie Griffin, Human Services Director, co-chair of the task force will present a report and members of the task force and then we'd like to invite Supervisor Ishida to give an update on Washington. So. Good morning Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Gary Kunkel, the Ag Commissioner. Our office is at 4437 South Laspina in Tulare. Um, just give you a quick flavor. Some of this is old news. Um, You've all seen now, last time I spoke to you, that very morning we had a conference call to get a consensus of the industry and, and our inspector staff. We've, we've now come up with an initial estimate that shows that of the navel oranges, for example, that were left on the tree, we expect that probably on the order of 75% of those will have been lost because of the freeze. 30% of the navel oranges had been harvested prior to the freeze, so that will give you kind of a flavor. If you add that up across the board for balanches, lemons, and that kind of thing, uh, we're estimating now total losses for Tulare County in the citrus industry of $418 million, and I know you've all seen that figure. Um, that's been provided to the legislature, to um, the state and federal uh, government both. We have, I always like to say that we have just over 50 packing houses, citrus packing houses in Tulare County. And I sort of say that vaguely because at some point you stop calling a facility a citrus packing house. We actually counted them up and we have 57 of them, if you count even the smallest operations. Uh, today, we have five of those houses that are operating full-time, full schedule. Uh, we have 27 packing facilities, citrus packing facilities, that are operating in some fashion. And that means shorter number of hours, a reduced number of days during the week that we work. And we have 25 facilities that are closed a lot of that represents consolidation. Uh, it's common for, for a packing facility to have two or three facilities, and when we have freezes like we had in December 90 and December 98, it was common for those to consolidate their operation and run what fruit they can through a single facility, so we're seeing some of that. Um, the watchword is caution, and, and growers, packers are being extremely cautious. They're very slow right now. There is a a genuine feeling to be to err on the side of caution so that we don't begin to flood the market with frozen uh, fruit. The other thing that's happening, you've all seen this, if you drive down the highway now you'll see truck after truck after truck going to the juice plants. That won't last forever and the juice plants now are getting backed up. And so um, some, some growers, for example, that have an opportunity to pick the juice are seeing that they're rationed. They can only take a certain amount. Uh, we've had people that, that tried to get their fruit uh, juiced and send it to Arizona. Arizona requires that, that even juice oranges be washed and waxed before they go there, so that's really not a good option for most people. But, but that will kind of give you a quick and dirty uh, synopsis of what's happening. Uh, because of the caution, we're, we're actually able to keep up with the demand for our inspection right now, and we'll see how that comes out in the future. I've heard a couple of optimistic things. I talked with a, a pest control advisor this morning that, that, that was talking about having to resume doing some treatments for Korea. And, and, you know, some time ago we would have thought there'd be no fruit that'd make it to Korea. I talked to a grower yesterday in my office who had 10, 10 acres of oranges that he thought probably could be exported. And I'm, and I'm going, wow, that's great. You know, 10 acres of oranges. He said, yeah, I have 1,400 acres altogether. So that'll give you sort of a flavor of what it is. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them, but that's where we are. Um, uh, Gary, do we have any idea yet about 
the quality of the trees, how the trees are, have held up? You know, uh, what we've heard is some of the very, very, very small trees. There's a very small acreage of grapefruit right across from my mother's place. Some very small trees may be lost. I talked to a grower this morning that had some replants. And he had some very, very young trees. He thinks he'll have to replant those again. Well, I, I haven't heard uh, reports of widespread tree losses, certainly nothing like we saw in December 90. So knock on wood, we hope that's the case. There will be some burn back of leaves and that kind of thing, but I would say there's cautious optimism about the state of the trees. I have one quick question also. The, the $418 million, um, I'm wondering if that's in today's crop the fruit that's on the trees, correct? Yes. That's not the trees, any other economic impacts. That's just, that's just the, the crop. cost of the crop. Yep. And, and we do that. We're required by an, an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with the California Department of Food and Agriculture and the USDA. We use a five-year average for that crop. If you actually use FOBs that were really taking place, you get a higher number. If you talk to Citrus Mutual, they'll tell you that really – the loss is bigger than that because in, to, in to the value of today's crop, the crop that was on the trees prior to the freeze, they were doing right. That was a very good year. And so, like I say, we're required to use a five-year average, which includes years that were not as good price-wise. But that's strictly the value of the crop. Gary, it's my observation as a grower in the Lindsay area, Strathmore, that this freeze was uh, spotty. Uh, it appears to me that the Lindsay area – probably fared better than most areas, and I think the Orange Cove area fared fairly well. And so there are isolated pockets where not isolated, well, did better than others, but there are areas that lost their total crops. There is nothing salvage salvageable. So I know growers who are going to, going to uh, probably be able to save 50 percent or a little more, but there are places that they're totally wiped out. Sure. So if when we talk about averages. Uh, the averages and the freeze damage to trees, you'll have areas south of Porterville that may have substantial tree damage and areas north of Orange Cove that may have substantial tree damage or west of the traditional growing areas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, for the record, my name is Donnie Griffin. I'm the deputy, I'm the director of human services. I still got to practice it a little bit. Um, I want to report to you that, uh, the number of people who refer to me as Donnie Who is on the decline as a result of my, um, co-chairing along with David Crawford, the, uh, uh, the Tulare County freeze effort, um, has been very great and I'm, I'm going to give you a little brief report of what's been happening so far. Um, Supervisor Shidash, Supervisor Ennis, you've attended some of the meetings, and I appreciate that. Your support is, is greatly appreciated. But um, we have began to fill the – we have filled all of the sub-chairs of those committees, and they will be meeting this afternoon uh, at about, I think, about 1 o'clock or 1.30, and then the full task – uh, uh, task force will be meeting, I think, at about 2.30, 2 o'clock, and um, that will be meeting here. So the effort is rolling fairly significantly. I want you to know that I am buoyed by some very, very capable people, and one of them I'd like to introduce to you right now, and it is uh, Carolyn Rose, who is chairing this effort from a community-based um, perspective and uh, very, very capable. I've asked if she would just come up and, and say a word or two. Uh, to you. Good morning, members of the board. I think in a minute someone else may be giving you some statistics about the kind of support and help that's going on in the community, but I just wanted to say a word or two to you, our leaders. Uh, you'll probably recognize this is the beginning of something you'll recognize. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. And this is our third season of a devastating freeze. And therefore, it's our time again to work together uh, to relieve human suffering and to save our economy for the future. And I just wanted to thank and commend you, 
the Board of Supervisors for your leadership. It was quick, it was strong, and I know it's going to be sustained that you'll be there leading us to the end and, uh, of, this, of this situation. Um, so thank you very much. And of course, thanks to all of the folks in the audience who are working on it, to your staff members, to other members of the community. Uh, your task force is dedicated to um, doing its very best to help you and work with you. Thank you. Um, secondly, I'd like to introduce a gentleman who, when I first came here, uh, along with Jim Sullins, they just uh, agreed to take me out to lunch and help me through a couple of uh, a uh, couple of uh, hurdles that I needed to know and understand about the county, and that's um, uh, Ernest um, Hernandez from um, United Way. Hernandez, did I get his name wrong? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Who's Ernest? <laughs> I haven't been called that since probably second grade. <laughs> and my mother used to call me that. <laughs> when you were in trouble? That's what used to happen to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all your support. Um, I think Carolyn hit it right on target. Um, it, this is great. Our, our um, folks have come together and doing great. Uh, funds are beginning to roll in, and uh, we appreciate uh, all the support. And there are different um, efforts taking place in different parts of the county, and we appreciate that. Uh, we continue to have discussions with uh, several foundations, and we hope that um, uh, soon they will actually be forwarding to us uh, sizable uh, contributions. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, a conference call uh, later this morning with a couple of foundations who are ready to make commitments to the effort. I also want to make you aware of the fact that on Friday the 9th, um, Univision will be conducting a fundraising event at the uh, Mervyn's parking lot here in Visalia from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, this effort has been put together uh, through the efforts of Lali Moeno and Rosalinda Evitia. Uh, they, they will be, uh, Univision will be uh, broadcasting live and encouraging people to come by and make uh, contributions of food, clothing, money, and so forth. Also, uh, Tulare County employees uh, have stepped up and um, they're being led by a, just a really awesome uh, team from Health and Human Services Agency. They're conducting their own internal a campaign uh, among employees, and that's going to kick off. It's a week-long campaign that's kicking off Monday, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, probably in the next week or so, uh, we will we'll convene our uh, allocations committee to begin actually uh, allocating dollars out to the different organizations in the communities of Tulare County. Can I answer any questions? Questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. Don't leave yet, Ernie. Okay. Uh, Shelley Abajian from the Fresno Area District, the Fresno Area District Director for Diane Feinstein is here to make a presentation. Hi. On behalf of Senator Feinstein, uh, Supervisors Yoshida and Worthley had the pleasure of meeting with her last week and she gave them this check for $1,000 to help in your relief Fantastic. and helping those who are so much in need at this time. As I traveled the areas that, along the coastal that have also been affected by the freeze, it's your agencies that are helping the most needed uh, with dollars that thank other you. resources aren't available. So well, thank, thank you, you so for much. your work. Thanks. And on behalf of the Senator. Thank you, Ernie, please come back. Oh, Not to be out there. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> I feel like I need to pull out my checkbook, but I left it uh, at home. I just want to give you a little a brief report of some of the information that's been flowing in. There's been a great deal of information that we are trying to bring together. And um, I'm going to ask uh, David Crawford to join me in a minute to let you know what the Health and Human Services Agency Tulare Works Group has been doing and the information that we've collected so far. What I know to date, and this information is coming from the committees, 
um, which we'll be reporting later uh, in the day as they bring all this together. They're doing a fabulous job, by the way. We do know that to date over uh, 3,900 have received some sort of free service through the Employment Connection. Um, we know that uh, almost 1,300 applications for energy assistance have been processed uh, in the Tulare County Employment Connection. That's at a cost of about $400,000 so far is the figure that I have. And a total of 2,300 or 2,366 freeze release uh, related unemployment claims have been filed. And we are developing all sorts of tracking systems. We're reaching back to some of the model of collecting information that we did, um, that was done, I should say. I wasn't here uh, in the 98, 99 freeze. And so we're, we're still getting a lot of data and we're putting together uh, sort of a, a template, if you will, of fact sheets so that we'll have them and be able to distribute it to you and others on a demand basis. And we're putting that together as we speak. So what I want to tell you is that this effort, uh, I believe we sort of got in front of this effort. Um, thanks to the, the, the very, very vigorous response to this community and the folks that are coming together here and um, that we will stay in front of it. And um, I'd like to ask David Crawford, who's the Deputy Director for Tulare Works, to share with you a little bit about uh, how Tulare Works uh, have collected information and what they know about the folks responding uh, on this freeze effort. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Supervisors. David Crawford, Deputy Director of Tulare Works Division, otherwise known as the Welfare Department. Um, so far uh, in our district offices and our outstation sites, we've taken applications from approximately 600 families for public assistance benefits. That would be the CalWORKs Cash Aid Program, food stamps, and Medi-Cal. Normally, this time of year, we take applications uh, from about 3,500 families uh, during January, February. So um, we're adding those in. We're probably over 4,000 families during this time, where it's normally 3,500. So that's about a 17% increase in our workload. Uh, most of the activity is occurring in the Porterville Lindsay offices. Um, some increase in the Dinuba area, some smaller in the Tulare Visalia offices. We do have a number of outstation sites that we can reach out to the community. They don't have to come into our district offices. So we've been working, we have staff co located all, all of the one-stop employment connection offices. So that's Porterville, Visalia, Tulare, and Dinuba. We also have staff that are making weekly visits to the Woodville and Linnell labor camps. Uh, also, we have staff that are going out to the communities of Terrabella, uh, Strathmore. We have a staff co-located at the Woodlake Healthy Start on a full-time basis. Uh, we're co-locating with the CSET staff in Orosi. Uh, we're activating uh, a site or a staff at the Ivanhoe Family Healthcare Network, uh, Pixley CSET office, uh, the health clinic in Early Mart. We also have staff that are um, going along with food Food Link's uh, Nutrition on the Go program. So we're available there to take food stamp applications at all of their sites. Um, in addition to the ones I mentioned, uh, let's see, we have Farmersville, London, uh, Delft Colony. Uh, so we're getting out there. And, uh, we're also uh, hooking up with the Proteus mobile van. They're going out to the communities of Poplar, Woodville, Early Mart, and Lindsay, and our staff will be available uh, at the mobile van sites as well. So we're seeing a lot of activity. Um, this is pretty typical of what we saw in the prior freezes. Any questions that I can answer for you? Okay, thank you.
Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, as a final note, I just want to let you know that my uh, supervisor, John Davis, had suggested to me earlier that I needed to get out and, and actually see the freeze and see what's going on. And so uh, David uh, saddled up the pony and we went out and um, we went out to Cutler Arosi where we visited with Jose um, Cuvedo, Cuvedo and uh, went out to Ivanhoe and met with uh, Douglas uh, Booker, city council person there, chatted with him about what was going on, uh, went up to Woodlake, visited the uh, WIC office and the Proteus office and talked to them about what was happening and then on to um, uh, Lindsay and Exeter and to Farmersville. Um, been chatting regularly with uh, Lolly Maheno, who's been instructing me and giving me some tips on folks to visit. So I wanted to let you know that this effort from our part is taking many dimensions and we're trying to make sure that not only are we bringing people here, but we're going out and we're trying to make an effort to make sure that uh, if access isn't getting to people where they are, that we are going to get that access to them. So at this point, I'll conclude my report and ask if there are any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. I guess this is my part of the program. On January 28th, a group of us flew to Washington, D.C. to uh, lobby on the issue of freeze relief in water matters and <clears throat> other issues. The group was made up of myself, Supervisor Worthley, Eric Coyne, Brian Haddix, Tulare County, um, excuse me, Tulare City Council member Carlton Jones, Lindsay Mayor Ed Murray, Lindsay Vice Mayor Pam Kimball, and a Lindsay staff person Diane Bukharov, and Porterville Mayor Cam Cameron Hamilton. We started our meetings on Monday, January 29th. Over the course of three days, we had 18 meetings, and we had 14 of them directly related to the freeze relief. What was very informative and a very positive impression that I received from that trip was that our congressional delegation uh, was working very closely with each other and that's Republicans were working with Democrats. And what they did is they took the different aspects of the freeze relief and they divided those functions up. So Devin Nunes' office was working on the social aspects of what we needed to, from the legislature to address social issues. Another Boxer's office, Senator Boxer's office was working on the farmer relief, so they, they divided everything up. So it was, when they came back together to, to write the legislation, uh, it was a very quick and easy process. The one thing we were able to do, which I believe was very, very beneficial to our electeds in Washington, was that we were able to meet with the different departments in the United States Department of Agriculture, FEMA, and other agencies and we were able to find out what programs used to exist that addressed some of the issues for our, our people who work in the industry and growers. And we were able to find out what legislation authorized those particular relief programs. Many of them have expired because of time, but we were at least able to pinpoint where the legislature could go back to and find the basic uh, verbiage for new legislation. So it kind of focused everybody in the same direction. We were able to talk to people about uh, rent and mortgage relief. It's a program which expired through FEMA, but at this point in time, uh, it's our understanding that Senator Boxer and is going to put that in the legislation uh, for the freeze relief. Extended unemployment. Because sometimes the state of California, you have a period of time you can collect unemployment and after that period of time you're no longer eligible. So we're trying to resurrect a federal program that would extend unemployment. 
The reason that this is extremely important to us in the citrus industry is that our, the people who work in the citrus industry are not migrant labor. They're, they're residents. The citrus industry is an 11 month, uh, it's an 11 month industry that we're packing. So our neighbors, the people we go to, to school with, we go to church with, they are residents, they are not migrants. So it's very important for us to keep our labor force intact in an area when we're going to need them again starting in November when we start harvest again. The one thing that we found through talking to our state representatives is, and from past experience is the fact that it's not unemployment that is the major issue, it's underemployment. When packing houses this time of the year are normally packing 10 hours a day, six days a week, uh, many of them had to cut their hours back to maybe four hours a day for three to four days a week. Before, if you earned more than $25, you were un ineligible to collect unemployment insurance from the state of California. Now there is legislation going through that will up that limit to $200. So you'll be able to earn $200 and still be eligible for un unemployment insurance payments. Addressing the farmer needs, we have a program that it was used in 1990 called the TAP program. It was for tree assistance. In these freezes in certain areas, you're going to, have, you're going to get substantial tree damage, which affects the crops for several years into the future. There may be areas after this freeze, especially in the lemon uh, industry, that may be damaged for at least two to three years uh, because of severe dieback. Lemon trees are highly susceptible to frost damage. You may have young trees which were just planted that will virtually, they will die on you. So the TAP program was set up to help farmers uh, be reimbursed for these expenses. I remember in 1990 we were also uh, reimbursed for pruning because some of these trees will require severe pruning and the TAP program provided funds back to, to the, the growers for pruning. So that will also be added into the freeze relief bill. Senator Boxer is taking the lead role in this freeze relief. And uh, again, I want to say it's very heartwarming to see that this is a nonpartisan uh, effort by our electeds in Washington, D.C. There was, I would also like to mention not only Washington, D.C., but as from our committee report from the freeze relief, we are very well prepared this time. Unfortunately, we've had recent uh, history of, of addressing a disa freeze disaster. We've had three freezes in the last 17, 18 years. As a grower, to me, these freezes, each one of them, were something that we would experience every 50 years. But as fate has had it, we've experienced three of these within 20 years. So we are very well positioned to provide a lot of this relief. And Tulare County is in a position to centralize this relief, which makes it a lot less confusing for the people I believe who are going to receive the relief. Our governor's office uh, has been very responsive and they are very well prepared to, uh, to deliver the aid that we need for, our, for the people affected by this freeze. Probably the easiest part about us going back to Washington DC or talking to our electeds in Sacramento is the fact that we're not educating them this time. <coughs> There's enough institutional knowledge that they share that makes a lot of things a lot smoother because we have been there and this is our third time in 20 years. A question came up about my role as a grower 
and being on the Board of Supervisors addressing and voting on freeze relief, uh, a, a possible conflict of interest. So for an exercise this morning, I took the uh, total number of acres in Tulare County and the total number of acres my family farm farms, and I found out how in, insignificant I, I really am. <laughs> <laughs> it, worked out, it worked out to about point zero zero two three. <laughs> So I'm like two thousandths of the industry. So I don't believe there's going to be a conflict of interest. Uh, I'd like to open this up for comments from uh, Supervisor Worthley. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to indicate how much I appreciated uh, our chairman's leadership on this trip. And it was very, very helpful uh, that he was also a citrus grower and so could respond to questions that were raised about the industry and, and what it meant. And that was very helpful in, in, in a number of our meetings. Also, I wanted to uh, thank the media, uh, who had an interesting kind of a position in this. They were back with us covering events from our local media. And uh, because of that, we found ourselves with a little bit more face-to-face -face time with some of our own elected officials. And that was, and that was helpful to us. And uh, I so hope, I so hopefully it was of interest to the people back here. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to meet with all of our elected officials, uh, including our state, our, our, our U.S. senators, Senator uh, Boxer and Senator uh, Feinstein, and uh, the press was able to come in and participate. And it was interesting to see the responses of folks. Um, uh, Diane Feinstein, when the press came in, really focused on something which it, I have to take kind of a, an aside about this, and that is you saw us today present a check for $5,000 from our good works funds, $1,000 from each district. But really what prompted that was when we met with Senator Feinstein's office and the press came in, obviously we're there trying to figure out how to access federal dollars to, to assist us in Tulare County. Senator Feinstein said, this is a time for us to look internally also, that people need to step up to the plate and help out. And she was encouraging people. I don't know if that got on the press, whether it got played here in Tulare County or not. But she was encouraging people to step up and give what they could give, whether it was $5 or $100 or $1,000, because this is going to take everybody's effort to help people who are going to be in need. And then she proceeded to write a check for $1,000 and give to us. Immediately when Al and I went outside, I said, we've got to call back to the county and make sure we, <laughs> we, we give $1,000 each out of our general, our, our good works funds, which we did this morning. But, but I think her point was well taken. Uh, too often our, our, our immediate response is to look to the government and say, what can the government do to fix this problem? And I, I appreciate Senator Feinstein saying, you know, it's not just a government issue. It's a people issue. And we need to be able to reach in to our own pockets and to help our, our people, other folks who are in need at this time. So I thought that was a, a, very, a very good meeting. And all of our meetings were excellent meetings. One of the things that I think that was alluded to, and I appreciated a very thorough report by, the, by our chairman, but was the idea of accountability. Our freeze relief uh, task force has developed an accountability. And, you know, I, I, I know we all shudder when we read about things that happen, such as the uh, problems in Louisiana and so forth, New Orleans, and money that was more how people got money for more housing assistance than there were houses, you know, that kind of thing. And those sorts of things, you know, we wanted to reassure our legislators money coming to Tulare County will be accounted for. And I very much appreciate Ernie and, and his organization because it's that kind of accountability which gives people confidence that as they give of their own money or as the government gives of its own resources, these funds are going to go to the people who need them, and there won't be uh, the opportunities for double dipping and triple dipping and cheating the system. Uh, I mean, there will always be people out there who will try to take advantage of things. But, but we really, I think, have an excellent system to limit or prevent that from happening. And so we wanted to assure our, our, our delegation funds to Tulare County will be accounted for. Uh, all in all, it was a very good meeting. It was good to have the city folks with us. Uh, they had their own take on issues because obviously many of them have the packing facilities in their, in their communities. They have the residents in their communities. And we had some really some very uh, interesting stories from Lindsay of the number of people who were showing up at their meetings, coming to the offices, trying to get relief. Uh, and so uh, this truly is an issue that affects all of us. We may not realize that because if you don't live in Lindsay, you may not see that. 
but the fact is that we're all affected by this freeze. And so very much appreciate uh, those who were able to go to the meeting and our opportunity to meet with our various elected officials and the various uh, departments that we met with. Everybody was very helpful. The governor's office, as we said, was very much on top of this. The, as you know, the governor was in Dinuba the week before we left with several of his um, secretaries from his, his cabinet. And when we met back in Washington, D.C. at the governor's office, uh, they were right on top of things. They are very aggressive on this matter. And so I believe all we're, we're really working well together here. And I want to thank the, the freeze relief effort that's being done by the committee and the people who are involved in that and the various nonprofits and churches and individuals because this is going to be a community effort, and it's, it's working very well. Thank you. Yes, you're nodding at me, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, um, I appreciate your efforts, all of you that went back there. I know we've often heard about walking the halls of Congress, and I'm sure that's exactly what you did, because every TV clip that I saw, you guys were walking down one hall or another. So uh, we know you're on focus, and we know you're on point. Um, it, I, too, like you, Supervisor Wordley, appreciative of Carolyn and Ernie and the community's work, because I think we all work best when we work together. And uh, it's so encouraging. Uh, I expect that from our community, isn't that? Uh, I mean, it's just the way we are here. And so um, people step up, and we've grown, grown accustomed to that. But this kind of melding of the uh, public and private sector in these times is, is very important. Um, last Friday, as we held the, the first meeting of the newly reformed California Partnership for the San Joaquin Valley, uh, both of you were able to attend. Supervisor Rashida to give uh, uh, some welcoming remarks and just an update and uh, with representatives from all eight counties. Secretary Bradshaw, of course, was there, Secretary Kawamura, Secretary Chrisman um, as their active participants, uh, but they were able to give some feedback. They've been integral, I think, in this process, uh, the help that they've been giving, um, especially Secretary Bradshaw, um, who has some funding that's available for this kind of help. So I just appreciate the efforts of every single person. Uh, from this board, from those that went with you, from the community, and every person I see contributing their, their $5 or whatever they're doing, it's, it's very heartfelt and very much appreciated. I just briefly, um, when our Ag Commissioner was giving his report, the reason I asked the question about the $418 million figure is that I hope people understand that that's the, the cost of that material only, the stuff that's hanging on the trees, uh, this has a, the potential to have a, a great impact on our county. Uh, as you know, if every dollar that is generated in the county is just not a dollar, it, it's several dollars. It could be three to five dollars because that money bounces around in the community by way of rent, money spent at grocery stores and so forth. So this has the potential to be I, I think close to a two billion dollar impact to the county of Tulare. So it's as you look at the cost of the fruit that's been lost, it's it's very severe. And and, and uh, but the the big picture is that this has the capability of, of to reach out and touch everybody in the county, just not farm workers or those that were picking the fruit or those that are packing the fruit, but uh, furniture store owners, uh, your restaurant owners, everyone that provides services to those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, can and probably will be affected too. So uh, I'm appreciative of the work the delegation did uh, in going out and, and trying to, to get some assistance back here because this will impact uh, every one of us. It'll, I'm sure it will impact myself as a contractor. Uh, you know, Supervisor, you have a, a point oh oh two three. Mine's probably a point oh 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 one <laughs> two three. Uh, but it will affect every one of us in the county. It has the potential to do that. So. Thank you for the time and efforts that you spent back in Washington, D.C. on our behalf. Uh, I would also like to echo what Phil said. You know, being a businessman for 35 years in the Portugal area, I've been through two of these freezes, and uh, it is a real devastation to the community, especially Porterville. We are a citrus community, uh, and it's going to be tough on everybody. So I want to thank all the uh, nonprofit organizations in the Porterville area and Lindsay and throughout that area. Uh, especially the, the churches, too, who have stepped up to the plate to help out. And uh, I'm very pleased to also see the, the $200 that these uh, farm labor people can get 
because we do definitely need them for the good fruit that's still out there. We, we need the workers. So uh, it's been a real effort on the part of, of, uh, of everybody in this, and I'm very proud of the uh, Freeze Task Force and what they've done, too. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, well, just one last thing. Uh, and I, we, we tried to, we tried to uh, really emphasize this while we were back in Washington, but it's important, I think, to, to uh, restate here because oftentimes when you have a, a, an event, people think of it as, okay, I gave my $10 um, and move on. This is an issue that will be with us for many months. And that is something which is a little different than some emergencies. This is not an emergency that happens today and then tomorrow we start uh, uh, turning things around. These folks who are in this industry will probably be unemployed until next November or underemployed until next November. That means, as Mr. Cox indicated, the impacts to our economy will go on through the rest of this year. Potentially could go into next year, depending on what kind of damage is done to the trees. So just to keep in mind that this is not a, a sprint. This is going to be a marathon, and uh, that we really hope that people stay engaged uh, in this process because it won't be, it won't be quick. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I just had one other quick question uh, for both of you. Um, I know you mentioned the, the Senators Feinstein and Boxer, and, and uh, we greatly appreciate their help. And you mentioned the other delegation. I, I know you met with uh, Congressman Nunes, Costa, Rodanovich. Did you get with Cardoza? Any? No, we didn't get with Cardoza. With their staffs? With their staffs? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, I know that um, they're involved uh, in this, too. And I wondered if their participation, you know, the, the leadership role that they're taking, if that's, if you see uh, future engagement with them or is there value to your meetings with them? I mean, what, was there any? Well, I think it's very valuable that we had a chance to meet with them uh, because past this freeze, it's about building relationships uh, with your electeds in Washington, D.C. because a lot of the issues we have in Tulare County, their, their districts have the same issues. So it's a lot easier for us when we go back next month to walk into their office because of, of uh, the results of the freeze relief it brought us together and opened those doors. So it's very va valuable to meet with all the Valley <coughs> delegation. One of the things we did because of the number of meetings we had, and, and of course it was a very fluid time, uh, meetings were being rescheduled, and so instead of just being on one side of the, you know, the House side, we were going back and forth between the House and the Senate, and, and we, we actually had to split up at certain times. And unfortunately, our delegation was of a size we could do that, where some would go to one meeting, one, some of us would go to others, and that, that allowed us to be able to meet with more people and be more flexible and, uh, with their schedules and our own. So. I, I know that there is a benefit to meeting with – we've known that in the past. The face-to-face -face meeting with even your own delegation in Washington has a value <laughs> that's different than meeting with them here in, in their own districts. And there's a sense of you made an effort to come back here. I'll make an extra effort to assist you in what's important to you. And so those are valuable meetings. You cannot underestimate the value of those meetings. So I'm very glad that we were able to do so. Thank you. I didn't mean to – I'd like to expand on something what Supervisor Worthy talked about, was, and that is accountability. Uh, we've had the Katrina disaster, as we all know, and we've had other farm disasters throughout the country. And Congress and the administration is very aware of accountability. Uh, part of that accountability will be that there is still a lot of work to be done in the citrus business. And will we have workers willing to do that work? Is public assistance sometimes a hindrance to, to uh, the workforce? So they're going to be monitoring the results of us at next year or, or even next week if we can't find labor because everybody's on public assistance. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, it's going to be more, I do believe it's going to be more difficult to get public assistance when these disasters arise again. And the one thing that, that the city of Lindsay was really pushing for was public works program. When people, a, a mass of people are unemployed, 
It creates other issues. It creates a lot of social issues. issues. It creates mental health issues. It creates uh, law enforcement issues because people are not satisfied just to sit home receiving a check. So Lindsay was proposing to put these people to work, take some federal funds, state funds, and put them to work on deferred projects that were uh, in the city of Lindsay, and I think I heard on the radio today they're ready to hire 200 people if they can find the funds just to do park work or deferred maintenance that hasn't been done for a lot of years. Well, apparently this is catching on. It's catching on on the state level and it's catching on on the federal level. It's a lot better to have people working than sitting at home collecting checks for unemployment because of the social issues. The other issue is that it, it really affects the grocery stores and other people when we keep providing food. It has a, dam it has a reverse effect upon certain industries uh, when you just provide food stuff to where people who normally have the opportunity to buy food, which helps the economy. So they're, they're looking very seriously at uh, a public works type of relief program. So that effort has caught on, and I think it has a lot of merit for future disasters, not only our freeze disaster. But the proof's going to be in the pudding. Will we have workers when we need workers? And uh, I hope we do have workers. Uh, I'm very confident that we will, but we'll see. Uh, before I leave the subject, I want to, to to everyone to understand, our group, our task force that went back to Washington, D.C. was originally scheduled before the freeze. We were there to talk about the mitigation of the loss of surface water from the San Joaquin River settlement. And we had several meetings on that. It was very successful. And it was really successful because we had the uh, cities represented and it took a different our electives in Washington, D.C. took a different attitude toward the settlement because it affects every resident in Tulare County or in the service area of the, of the Friant uh, water users. It's not a farmer and environmentalist issue. It affects every one of us. So we were able to, to move the light off of the farmer environmental struggle to water quality of all the residents in the service area of the Front Water Authority. So with that. Just one last thing, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to mention, I, I had forgotten her name, but the governor's office uh, effort is being led by Leanne Linty in, in Washington, D.C., and just wanted to just say a word that she's an excellent person, very much on top of this issue, and appreciate very much her, her efforts on our behalf. Right, yeah. and yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you guys have covered it all so well, and, and Supervisor Worthley just tagged up with the mentioning of Leon Lenti, and, and that made me think that, as you recall, at the end of our last meeting we had at USDA, we were in the conference room right off of the Secretary's office, and we had just met with the Deputy Undersecretary, and as, every, as all the dignitaries, um, the Washington folks, um, exited out of the building, out of the room, and we sat around the conference table, we came to realize that with the efforts of the Tulare County Supervisors and the representatives from Porterville and Tulare and Lindsay, that this group had, was, was actually in the lead, uh, had met with more agencies and more uh, elected officials on Capitol Hill than anybody else and, and became very incumbent on, on the group to look into itself and, and craft a, a solution. And, after after that was done, um, we then tagged back up with uh, Leanne Lenti in the governor's office to make sure that we were in lockstep with where the governor's administration was going. And it was quite pleasing to see that the next declaration that came out from the governor's office included a number of the very um, measures that uh, your board and the uh, city council representatives had discovered in meetings with departments and had uh, shared with elected officials and with the governor's office. So it's great to see fruit of your efforts come back so quickly uh, with more, I'm sure, to come. 
And also, um, it was good to see that uh, the governor's ag secretary and labor secretary have tagged up closely with your board to make sure that we all stay on the same page. It's Freezes are, are crises, but to see things move with this level of teamwork and a sense of keep your eye on the goal, it's very refreshing. I think I want to conclude with um, the report is the reason that all of these different fa uh, facets of this relief need to come together quickly is that they, our electors plan to put this on a trailer bill for the Iraqi-Afghanistan <coughs> war appropriations, which will be coming before uh, the Senate and the House real, in, I imagine, within two weeks. So it was very timely that we were there, and that's why we feel that a little confident we get it attached to the appropriations bill that we're going to be able to see that the freeze relief quicker than we've seen in the past. Okay. Okay, moving on to our. Well, we did, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to take a motion, an action to uh, reaffirm the declaration of state of emergency, and I would so move. Second. Please cast your vote. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, now we can move on. Move on to the consent calendar. Uh, there's two changes I'd like to make. It is on item seven. It, this contract will be re retroactive to October 1st, 2006. And item 10, uh, this contract will be subject to council approval. Are there Mr. Chairman, there, if there are no other um, items, I would move approval of the consent calendar items 2 through 23 with the changes noted on item 7 and 10. Okay. Second. second. The motion is seconded. Uh, please cast your vote. The vote is unanimous. Through the consent calendar. Okay. Moving to Untimed items. Moving to item 24. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian Summers, our, the CAO's office, is addressing this issue for you. Good morning. Brian Summers, Senior Capital Projects Coordinator. I am pleased to present the Visalia Library Expansion and Renovation Project for your review, review and to request approval to bid the project. In June of 2002, the County of Tulare submitted and was subsequently awarded a grant from the California State Library in the amount of $3,426,131 for the expansion and remodel of the Visaya Library. The grant required a 35% local funding match. This was accomplished through a collaborative effort between the County, the City of Visalia, and the local donations spearheaded by the Tulare County Library Foundation. The project includes a complete renovation and conversion of the historic 1936 library into the new children's wing. The library administration will also occupy a portion of this space. Also included in the project is the addition of a new lobby and circulation area that will collect the, connect the 1936 building to the main library. And the final component of the project is a renovation and modernization of the main library to include handicap accessible restroom upgrades, new carpet, the expansion of the computer lab, and an expanded young adult space. Construction is expected to be completed in 12 months, and the construction cost is estimated at $4.9 million and is budgeted in the Capital Projects Fund. As has been previously reported to your board, there have been several delays in the design phase of the project. Most notable were the Office of Library Construction's request to revise the building program, the temporary involvement of the State Historic Preservation Officer, and actual construction methods that were exposed during Phase I hazardous materials abatement. These items alone amounted to a two-year delay of design. <coughs> and with that said, I am happy to report that the final bid documents have been approved by the Office of Library Construction. Design is complete, and the project is ready to bid. A negative declaration has been filed with the State Clearinghouse Fulfilling California Environmental Quality Act requirements. And at this time, I would like to introduce County Librarian Brian Lewis, who will take us through a PowerPoint presentation of the project. Brian? Good 
morning, board. Good morning. I guess I need that. Uh, this may take a second to load, if I can, because the uh, program is very graphic intensive. Oh, came up a lot quicker than thing at work. Uh, what you're looking at, and you've seen some of these uh, graphics already, but today I'm going to put it more in perspective for you so you have an idea of what you're actually um, viewing. Uh, this is a current shot of the 1936 uh, Visalia, old Visalia Library. You can see the fence around uh, the area. Uh, that was put up during the uh, first hazardous material uh, mitigation. Uh, you can see the windows boarded up and you can see some gray area around the windows. That's where they had to sandblast the uh, lead-laden uh, paint off the building so that they can work on it. This is the new library site plan. There's basically uh, three areas like Mr. Summers mentioned. There's the 1976 building uh, that we're currently using for library services. Come on, baby. There we go. There's the 1936 old Visalia Library. That will mainly be uh, the children's library plus some admin. And right in the middle, there's uh, some new construction and that's uh, about a 2,000 square foot lobby that's being added. Our first slide shows you a rendering of the old 1936 building from the corner of Oak and Locust. And what you're looking at is uh, the old entrance to the city library, and that's the new children's uh, courtyard that will be used uh, for programming purposes when the weather's nice, but uh, not without adult supervision. This is a view from about the same area of our eastern or our locus entrance. Uh, the architect has some very beautiful pergolas that will have plants on them, and it's a very nice, inviting entrance to the library. Right now, you don't even know where the entrance to the library is. It's kind of hidden. Uh, and with the rework of all the sidewalks, we think this will uh, be very effective in bringing more traffic into us. Uh, this is the main floor of the current library. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, on the, uh, lo the, your lower uh, left-hand corner, you see the parallel lines. Those indicate the pergolas that are the two entrances off of uh, uh, Encina and off of Locust Street. Now, looking from the Encina entrance, you're looking through the new lobby area into the current 1976 library building. Uh, the little golden railway to the right is at the start of the entrance to the children's area, and straight ahead will be where our new reference desk area, our reference service area will be. Going back to the main plan, but now looking basically southeast from the circulation desk into the new children's wing, you'll see that we have uh, eye contact, uh, visual contact with the children's desk you can see in the background. And you can see the beautiful woodwork that's going up on the ceiling that will match the historic woodwork in the building. This is a, uh, the children's wing, which is the 36 building. Looking from the rotunda area back north, we're looking into the, the new uh, lobby or the circulation area. Again, those, that's the same woodwork and lighting. Uh, there's the computers on the, on the left. And the door on the left is our new homework center. Again, the children's building, but this time looking from the nonfiction wing, I believe, through the uh, children's circulation area or reference area into uh, the, uh, the circulation or the new lobby area. If you look above on the top, that's the old copula area, and that's the uh, just really gorgeous woodwork. So that's what we're doing. It's been a, a, a long time coming for us. I was a much younger man when this started. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all were. I lost uh, a number of years, and like John Wayne said and Big Jake, and they're years I couldn't afford to lose. But uh, we're very excited about it, and it's going to be great for uh, the entire uh, county community. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I, one thing I... I wanted to I appreciate very much the update and and I know it's been a long time coming and I know that uh, you've had contacts with various members about when when's this project going to come get completed and and it's 
that's one of the dangers of term limits. You know, you, if you don't hang around a while, you don't see anything <laughs> happening. It's, uh, it's nice that as I start my third term, this one of those projects that kind of began early in my career as a supervisor, and I'm going to be around hopefully to see it completion. To completion. Uh, the one thing I was going to say is that, you know, I made a comment to you, uh, uh, Brian, one time when I called you. Uh, the park on which our library is situated has a name. The name of the park is Tipton Lindsay Park. Tipton Lindsay was an early uh, attorney in Tulare County, was also a member of the Board of Supervisors, a well-known individual. And I was just thinking while we're in the process of doing this, and I'm sure there will be some times to put plaques and so forth up related to the project, it might be nice to make reference to Tipton Lindsay Park as being uh, where we are. I mean, and I appreciate also the fact, and it's very fortunate, usually when we look at old buildings like this, they would have been demolished to build a new building. In this case, the fact that it was left there uh, all these years, I'm sure it had its downside because of dealing with cost and so forth. But the upside is we have a pretty beautiful structural building that will looks like meld very nicely into to our, our newer building. And I think it's a great project, one we'll be very proud of. It'll be a, a real um, benefit to our county and certainly to the community, if I say. And so I want to thank you all for hard work, persistence, continuing down the path, and, and not giving up. And, and we're going to see the fruits of our labor. Thank you, Supervisor. Half of that property is the city of Visalia, so we'll work with them at the getting a plaque uh, with the name of the park. It's an excellent idea. I would suggest contacting the Clampers. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> They'll pay for it. <laughs> Good idea. Thank you, Chairman. If there are no further questions, I would ask your board to approve the construction documents and authorize staff to bid the project. Move approval. Second. Chairman. We move and seconded for approval. All in favor, cast your ballot. I mean, just cast your ballot. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank vote you. is unanimous. Approval. Moving to, to item <laughs> 25, general plan amendment. Request for general plan amendment. Morning there, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is George Finney, uh, the County Resource Management Agency. I'll be presenting this item to the board this morning with the assistance of Chuck Chabelsky. Um, item number 25 is a request from Richard uh, Garabedian uh, for authorization to file a general plan amendment and rezoning on approximately 30 acres in the Kings River area. Uh, the property is located on the uh, west side of uh, Road 28, north of Avenue 388. Um, and is in located in proximity to the Kings River, uh, Kingsburg gun, gun Club and the Old Kings River Park property. Uh, the property is currently in a vineyard. Uh, the request uh, before you is to authorize a general plan amendment and application and rezoning that will change the general plan from agriculture to residential. Uh, two uh, planning uh, policy documents apply to this particular area. Uh, you have a sub-regional plan, which is called the Kings River Plan, adopted in 1982. Uh, this is really the guiding plan document. It designates the site as agriculture, although it is in proximity to what was called an opportunity area along the Kings River. The second planning document is the Rubai Lands Plan. It also applies to this area. Uh, we did a, point, a preliminary point count, and it uh, gets 23 points, which, as you know, is prevent the property from being rezoned uh, under that uh, plan. Um, in analyzing this case, uh, without going into too much detail in the staff report, uh, staff concluded that there are two possible approaches if the, um, to be investigated if the application is allowed to, to, to uh, proceed, uh, both of which would be more than simple uh, plan or, or map changes. It would, both, it would also involve some text changes and policy uh, issues. The first one would be to designate the, the site as residential in the Kings River Plan. Uh, we would point out to you, however, that the areas shown for residential in the Kings River Plan are, are uh, fairly uh, restricted. They were only allowed for areas that were uh, uh, infill or expansion of existing uh, residential areas. This particular site does not qualify for either of those considerations. Uh, the second uh, possible approach would be to expand the yeah, quarter mile uh, opportunity area. I don't know if you have a map that shows that, Chuck. It's the 
uh, dotted green line right here. This is a quarter mile uh, radius along the Kings River within which uh, uh, properties, if they meet certain criteria, could uh, be considered for, uh, for residential or um, uh, recreational uses oriented to the river. Uh, however, in reviewing the uh, application, even if the, that opportunity area was expanded to include the area, uh, it would not meet three of the four criteria for development. So again, it's not a simple, straightforward uh, map amendment approach that would be involved. Um, you um, also have, I believe, in your packet correspondence from the Kings River Gun Club, and I believe it's Hammer Time Company, uh, expressing their concerns regarding the, the proposal and, uh, and uh, in, in opposition to for any residential development in the area. And finally, as noted in the report, we've outlined three options for the board to consider. Um, briefly, one would not be allow, not allow the general plan amendment to go to the next step. Uh, basically, it would create a major precedent for deviating from rule by lands plan. The second option would be allowed the general plan amendment to proceed along the lines as I've uh, suggested. And the third option would be a, pl a place to request on hold for consideration for a future review and update of the Kings River plan. It's likely that the Kings River plan will uh, be reviewed uh, after the uh, schedule for review after the general plan update is, is, uh, is adopted because we'll have to review all the community plans uh, uh, for consistency with that document uh, uh, at some point in time. That concludes my staff report, unless there's any uh, questions. We have one Bill. quick question, if I may. On the front page <coughs> report, I'm going to need a 30-second uh, education here. So the soil type for the site is Yetum Sandy Loom on a Class II soil with a story index of 90 plus. I just have a big old question mark and a circle around that. Can you give me a 30 second explanation of what that means? Um, well, close of all, the soil type, of course, we, <laughs> that's just the type of soil. It's, it's mapped by uh, soil conservation uh, uh, people uh, on the county soils map. The class two soil means that it's a, uh, it's a prime soil, or the land capability classification system also uh, developed by soil scientists. And the story index rating is another a way of rating the, uh, the agricultural capability of, uh, of a particular soil. Any rating more than 80 is, is considered prime. So this is prime agricultural land. And I, I notice on the map that this property is surrounded on basically three sides by trees. So this soil is suitable for trees, row crops, any? Most, mostly, yes, vineyard, vineyards and uh, stone fruit. Thank you. That's it. Is there anyone here wanting to address this issue? Please come up and give your name and your address. I don't think it's a uh, my name is Bill Hammerstrom. Um, I'm with the Hammer Time Company. Uh, address is 3084 Avenue 390. Uh, I live near the proposed amendment here. Uh, I, I would just like this morning to reiterate uh, and highlight some of the uh, points that uh, the letter we wrote um, to uh, Steve Worthley, the, the, the chairman, um, uh, residential developments uh, are most appropriate when they occur either within the city limits or within a city's sphere of influence. Uh, piecemeal and leapfrog land development within unincorporated areas of the county on productive and prime farmland are basically irresponsible. Furthermore, it tends to increase the urban sprawl and places increased demand for infrastructure and support area growth, which lends itself to even more development. Uh, I, too, um, concur with the Resource Management Agency's findings. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to quote uh, some of those findings as well. The proposed project does not further the goals, objectives, and policies of the existing Kings River Area Plan. The site's land use designation is agricultural and has been zoned AE20 since 1977. 
under the Kings River Plan, the site is not designated for urban type development and will be governed by the RVLP. The preliminary checklist from the RVLP determined the project site cannot be considered for non-ag zoning. The project site is currently in agricultural production and there is no community sewer or water systems nearby. Though the site is in proximity to the Kings River development, subarea A and the opportunity areas, the project is not within the quarter mile opportunity area or designated for urban development in the plan. We do, we do have copies of all this. Okay, I understand. Um, my basic point is, uh, based on these and other considerations, we strongly urge your board to deny Mr. Garabedian's request uh, for this general plan amendment. Uh, we have a lifestyle out there in this area, and uh, Mr. Cox just was talking about the soil type out there. This is a soil type that you can't find anywhere, and if we wind up putting concrete and asphalt over this type of soil and it keeps going on and on, uh, basically where are we going to farm? Tulare County Agricultural is the, is the thriving factor of this county and, and of this state, and to be taking prime ag land out of use uh, not only affects the lifestyle we farm and the people that farm around us, but it, uh, lifestyles for future generations. So, thank you very much. I'm Richard Garabijan. Me and my brother are the owners of that property. First of all, I want to appreciate the board of supervisors hearing us today. My wife, Ellie, is here also. There's two sides to every story. I want you to listen to what I have to say first before you make any rash decisions. <laughs> we purchased the land in January of 1960, 47 years ago. My wife and I lived there from May 1963 to September 1975. We never put the land into this Williamson Act because my younger brother, my older brother, and I bought the land to sell for housing because of where it is located. We never were notified that the ranch had been put into a Kings River plan in 1977 and that any landowner could have opted out of the plan at that time. We should have been notified by mail. At that time in 1977, my wife and I had just moved into our home on our ranch on Adams Avenue just outside of the town of Fowler so I could take care of my younger brother who after coming home from the service was involved in an automobile accident and spent 40 years in a wheelchair before dying in 2001. For 15 years, I tried to find a buyer for the property for residential housing. On February 8, 2005, my brother and I sold the property to a home builder who has and is even now building in Fresno, Kings, and Kern County, but he had never built in Tulare County. But before going into escrow, he called the Tulare County Planning Commission and was told there would be no problem for him to build on the property. He got the okay from Beverly Aptos and others there. His name is Barry Bernstein. We went to Chicago Title in Reedley and started the escrow on February 8th. My brother and I were very happy because we were up there in age and this was our 401 retirement. Besides, the last few years we have been losing money on the ranch because the vines are over 100 years old and the ranch is planted 10 by 12, the vines. Now, being a farmer, you understand what I mean, 10 by 12. There's only 11,000 vines on the ranch, but it should have at least 18,000 vines. At my age of 75, and my brother, who's 79, we're not going to dig them out and replant and wait three years, if we're lucky to live three years, and spend $150,000. Well, when Barry went to get the permits, he was told he couldn't build because of this Kings River Act Reserve that we knew nothing about. The ranch I live on by Fowler and the home ranch I was born on by Delray have been in the Williamson Act ever since it came out, but we never put this property in because we bought it to sell for housing. Barry and I met with Henry Hash, George Feeney, and Chuck Poliski a number of times to settle this, and they told me we should see Mr. Steve Worthy, the supervisor, and we did so. My wife and I met with him, and he says that we should uh, try to work within the system and come in front of the board, and here we are today. 
I have two friends that are lawyers in Fresno, and they told me that since we have owned the property since January 1960 and that the Kings River Act Plan didn't happen until 1977, that our property is grandfathered in and that Tulare County would have to let the escrow take place or have to buy the property themselves. I thought it would be much better to work within Tulare County instead of getting involved with attorneys. I got drafted into the Army into the Korean War to protect our system of free enterprise. And what is taking place here, here seems more like communism to me. We have owned the land for 47 years, paid the higher taxes, keeping it out of the Williamson Act, and have my buyer on the property fell through. This really is sad because I'm not no kid anymore. The back part of our property is at least one half mile from the Kingsburg Gun Club house and not a but it as stated in the letter by the Hammerstorms, who, by the way, are newcomers to the area, only being here several years when they bought Robert Peterson's 20 acres. Robin kept his house one acre and yard, and the Hammerstones built a new home a little over 30 acres away on Avenue 390. And we as neighbors never gave them any trouble when their parcel was less than 20 acres, so the new home, according to the new plan, was not legal to build. We didn't, we didn't say anything to them. Sooner or later, all of this land, mine and the Joneses' family are my good neighbors, and some of our other neighbors is all going to be into housing because of its location to the freeway, Kingsburg Golf Course, the river, and the city of Kingsburg. Over the years, we have had all kinds of offers to sell one acre or more from people to build a home. Barry Bernstein was going to build one million dollar homes with three car garages. So it was going to be a win-win situation for Tulare County and newer and higher taxes besides employment for construction workers. All of this property is high ground and homeowners here will never have to worry about being flooded out. I still remember some 40 years ago where many of the homes around the golf course had water in them because being on low ground. Right now, housing is on the downside, and I don't know how many years it's going to take me to find another buyer to build the same type of housing. But I would like it to be during my lifetime. That's why we gave the money needed to be here today and asked for your blessings on this future project. Also, this would also help Tulare County, who owns 85 acres between me and the river, being developed in some worthwhile project. It's been sitting there for a number of years. There's 85 acres down there between my place there's five acres between me and the Jones' zone, and then the lowland starts, and the Tulare County has this 85 acres down there, and it goes all the way up to where the gun club, they do their shooting. And it's been sitting there a number of years, just, just sitting and sitting and sitting. So this would be worthwhile for Tulare County and the Tulare County taxpayers also. And we'd wish you would consider all these things. Now here, I made these out over a year ago when I thought that uh, we were going to come in front of your supervisors at that time. It's points to consider before you make any rash decisions. But I don't believe that any progress would ever take place if somebody has something a mile away or a half mile away and nobody can build. Well, then everything would just come to a complete standstill. I mean, we've been there 47 years. The Hammerstrom's just came several years ago, built a house over 30 acres away and they're complaining. I'm very surprised that the neighbor, they even came here today to even express their thoughts like that. Now, the Joneses own all, most of the land around me and all the way around by the river and everything else. And he has children and grandchildren. And I'm sure that someday he would want to sell his property too. I mean, he just doesn't want to farm all the time. Farming is getting harder and harder all the time with the labor and we're just lucky if we don't get froze out on our vines now with no moisture in the ground right now. Citrus is bad enough, but if it doesn't rain pretty soon and we don't get the dew point up, we're going to have trouble with our vineyards also. Well, I want you to consider all those points. I don't want you to make a rash decision, but I would like you to say it's okay if we could build on it, give us a zoning change. Had we known in 1977 that we could opt out, we would opt out. We were there way before. We were grandfathered in. But that's all I have to say. Ellie, do you have anything to say, honey? No. One other thing. We met many, many times with uh, the Planning Commission Director Henry Hash, and George Feeney, and Chuck here. Very nice people, and uh, they weren't against it. If they had been against it, I wouldn't have put up the $1,116 to be here in front of you today. 
And uh, sooner or later, that's all going to be homes because it's a terrific area to live. And the only reason I moved is my brother was in a wheelchair, and I had to take care of him for 40 and a half years until he passed away, and I had to get closer. Otherwise, I would have just stayed right there because it's a wonderful place to live. Mr. Garbini, if you have something to give to the clerk, if you'd... I will. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's Thank a, you. That's your role, by the way. But this points to ponder, so please don't make a rash decision. Okay? Thank you. Hi. My name is Betsy Tunnell at 38550 Road 16, Kingsburg, California. I'm also affiliated with the Kings River Conservation Committee, but I'm not here today on behalf of them because I just found out about this agenda item yesterday and I wasn't able to call a meeting in one day and have everyone get together. So I'm here on my behalf of myself today. Um, as you know, I have uh, studied the Kings River Plan. And in 1982, I'd just like to read uh, five names. <coughs> Clyde Gould, District 1. Could John. You sum that up instead of... All right. We would like to urge you to be consistent with the Kings River Plan in what they saw as vision at that time for land use planning along the river, and also be consistent with your goals of the current general plan, uh, not compromising agriculture in this valley. And therefore, I, as an individual, would like to urge you to not allow this to continue because it isn't something that is going to be beneficial in the long term for the most people. It will be beneficial to Mr. Garabedian, which I totally see his point of view. However, the tax dollars will not come to Tulare County. They'll go to Kingsburg for shopping and other places, and there will be additional need of resources for that kind of density too far out away from unincorporated cities and other cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Kathleen Satomi Omachi, 759 F Street, Reedley. I'm here today on behalf of El Rio Reyes Conservation Trust. We would like to bring to atten your attention, um, and we believe that uh, the working, further working between your board, your staff, and the applicant uh, will be needed for a full discussion uh, of the accountability on this project and of the County of Tulare. The two issues are the state concern for levees, and in particular they've talked about the Kings River, and the federal government on FEMA on the development of properties, commercial and residential, within the 100-year flood plain. Presently they are looking at the San Joaquin. From my understanding yesterday, it will be extended to the Kings River. We believe that property owners, farmers, citizens of any area within our county really do need to have a progressive life. We do need to work together, and that's what we, we would um, strongly uh, suggest, because all of us are at the mercy of the weather, as you have discussed earlier. We cannot control the freezes, the droughts, or the floods. However, one issue on the Kings River that just came up this year was that was not at a flood stage is that you did have a residential development um, that abutted the river, and they had to sandbag because, as you know, the currents of the river, it's not the topping out of a flood, as they saw in um, New Orleans, sadly. But the water action on the side of any bank or on the base of any levee, that is what eats away at the kind of barrier that we've established to protect our farmland and residential areas. You had a very small indication of that when you had a piece of um, residential area that needed to sandbag or they started to lose their footing underneath um, their trailer, trailer homes. But again, it is an issue of prime th farmland. It is an issue of property owner rights. Um, there is an issue of the county being faced right now with economic decisions with the freeze and what will be affecting the communities for the next year. But there are other sources of funds possibly that we as the um, El Rio Reyes Land Trust could assist you in meeting with several of the national organizations. If you did wish to look at this in preserving it in farmland or as a park, um, but it would also be as a financial benefit for the current property owner. Once again, we would ask that you would not make uh, 
give approval of this application today, but take it under long-term consideration. Not long-term, because as he said, he's getting older, but that it would be a full discussion on uh, which would benefit Tulare County, the property owners, and um, basically the health and safety of our communities. Thank you. We will be drafting a letter for your consideration. Thank you. I'd like to bring this back to the board at this time. Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, begin, and I encourage uh, uh, the comments from other board members. Uh, Tulare County has a process in place whereby general plan amendment requests come before the Board of Supervisors before they are processed. Um, this is not, I guess, the case in all counties. Uh, people can just simply file an application for a general plan amendment and then go through the process. Tulare County determined that it was in the best interest of the county and of applicants to have this preliminary process so that people would not um, engage in something which was not going to happen. In other words, it would not be a waste of time both on the part of the applicant and on the part of the, of the county. Uh, we've had a number of these come before the board since I've been on the board and always it's been my position and I think the board has generally gone with that, that if there was any possibility that a person's project could go forward under our existing rules, then it was my position no matter that there might be many obstacles to it, that they'd be given the opportunity to do that. Because it's not the position of the board, I think, to say, no, you can't even try uh, to go through this process. You ought to be given the opportunity to try to go through the process. There have been other occasions, and I believe, unfortunately, this one falls in that one, where, where, there is no <laughs> where there's no chance that something's going to succeed because of rules in place uh, that we have said to the applicant, it's not worth the, your time and it's not worth our time to proceed with something which will not have any opportunity of success. And in this case, I've heard all the testimony from people, and, and believe me, uh, Mr. Garabinian, this is not a rash decision. This is something based upon I've given a lot of thought since we first met and you brought this proposal to my position or to my attention, is that under the Rovai Lands Plan, we have what is considered an absolute bar to development unless you meet certain points. And, and this is a clear case where any kind of actively farmed property in Tulare County is not going to pass that bar. It, it just doesn't happen. If you're farming property in Tulare County, uh, unless you're trying to farm property on a mountainside where you've got really poor soil, soil quality or something of that nature, you're not going to be able to make the point system which allows you to do anything with this property other than agricultural pursuits. And that, this property fits directly in that. And it doesn't matter whether it was in the, the, the Kings River study area or outside because these rules apply to all of Tulare County. Any property that's zoned agricultural, for agricultural purposes is subject to rural value lands plan. So actually, in order for this to proceed, you would have to come in and seek a general plan amendment to modify the rural value lands plan for this project to go forward. And that's not the application that's before us, and it's not really an appropriate thing to be on a per-project basis because that's a, a, that is a, 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 of interest throughout the county. Uh, your, this project, as you can see, uh, opens up the Pandora's box to every other piece of property that's zoned AE20, AE10, AE40. It's, it's agricultural property subject to the rural value lands plan. So in this case, I don't have to get the other issues about, you know, levies, uh, whether it's within a, whether it's inside or outside of a, a, a flood zone areas. We don't get there because we can't get over this rural value lands plan and the point formula that, that we have in place. And again, this does not just apply to your property, Mr. Garabini. It applies to all agricultural property in Tulare County. And so this, I believe, is a clear case where there is no point in moving forward with this project until such time or if there is a change in, in our, the rules of how we play the game in Tulare County. May I have a right to address what you just said? Well, I, I, I think it's time for the board to deliberate on this. I appreciate your comments that you had before. Yeah, I just have one thing to say. Between 1960 and 1977, I could have built anything I wanted and there was no problem. I was told that. But in 1977, they came through with this Kings River deal, 17 years after I already had the property. And that sure doesn't seem right to me that in this country that could take place, that anybody could just say whatever they want. I could understand if I had bought the property after 1977. Yes, you're right, completely right. 
But anything prior to that, you should at least give consideration a little bit. And my land is high land. Forty years ago, I remember all those houses around the Kings River or the golf course, some were underwater. The water can't get to this property. There's Thank no you, way. Sir. And what you're doing to me on this decision is going to affect my neighbor Joneses, my good neighbors, and everybody else who's looking to sell their property for homes or commercial development. And how about Tulare County, the 85 acres they have down there? So please don't make rash decisions. And again, and my, my comments are not rashly made. They are based upon uh, being on this board for eight years and having had experience with these things for some time. Uh, I understand your, your concern. Again, it applies to a lot of people who own property in Tulare County, even if we were to take what you're saying, the subset of people who owned property prior to the implementation of our general plan. Uh, yes, my, my mother used to use your approach on her, on her property, would be able to build a subdivision. No, she will not be able to because it applies to all people who own property in the ag, in the ag zone property. And, you know, I, I, I don't believe there's any uh, basis of a legal challenge to that. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it, it's clear we, have, we live within the rules that we have adopted and we've had in place for many, many years, and there's no point in proceeding with a project that doesn't have a chance to see in the light of day. And so this is the appropriate time for a denial of, a, of an application for a general plan amendment because there is no conceivable way that this project can go forward under the existing rules that we have in, in Tulare County. So uh, I understand how the county works, and, and I appreciate that. I'm Ellie Garabedian. Um, when we originally found out that uh, there was notification in some very obscure newspaper uh, that you could opt out of the plan, so this is my question. Uh, we didn't see that paper. We didn't get whatever it was, Porterville, or you know, uh, we get the Fresno Bee even then when we lived there. Uh, but. If you could have opted out of the plan then? It would have made a difference. It wouldn't have made would a difference? It would not have made a difference. No, because, because what, what we've applied, this, this rural value lands plan formula applies to all ag property, not just the property that's within the Kings River uh, study area. It, it applies to all of our ag property, so it would have made <coughs> no difference. But we were told, I think George Finney told us, that many people opted out. I guess they saw that uh, notification. So they opted out of this plan and, and many other plans, I suppose. So that means even though they opted out, now they're still under the plan? No, they would still be under our general plan. In other words, the county general plan has various components of it, which would include this particular plan. In other words, another way of looking at it would be, uh, just as you, would, as you go through a process of development, you would have the general plan you have to deal with. Then if you were within a study, a different kind of a plan, you would also be subject to the rules and regulations concerning that particular plan. But in this case, you can't get past the, the, the original general plan, which applies to all ag property in Tulare County. So what happened to the people who opted out? I don't, I don't Mr. <laughs> Chair, <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I can, I think we're, we're way beyond what is normally allowable here. Uh, I just have one quick comment. Mr. Garabedian said sooner or later it's all going to be homes. Um, I do not agree. It's not going to be homes. Uh, it's in the surrounded by trees. Um, it, it's not going to happen. So I would make the motion to deny the applicant at this time. Well, I, I will second the motion. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is uh, that I, you never say never because who's to say that the city limits of, of Kingsburg won't someday extend out to this area. But certainly it will probably be on our lifetimes, Phil. <laughs> but I, I believe under the current rules that we have, there is no way this project will be able to see the light of day. Therefore, it makes no sense. And that's, I believe, the reason why the policy was put into place, that folks come before this board so they don't waste further time and energy. I mean, there's no point in going forward with a project which will not be able to, to change, would change, get what they want, unless there's fundamental changes in our general plan uh, and the rural value lands plan as applies to property throughout Tulare County. Uh, this has been a motion and a second. I would like to add the comment. <clears throat> uh, never is a very strong word. <laughs> And we have I properties in the, in the foothills that are, we have conservation easements, development easements on them now. And I strongly would suggest 
any group that's looking to preserve the Kings River, uh, this is a prime piece of property that you need to look at on purchasing a uh, development easement because uh, someday when maybe we're all gone from this board and maybe pushing daisies, that pressure is always going to be there. So I strongly recommend anybody with an interest in preserving the Kings River should talk to the Garabedians about purchasing a development easement. So with that, uh, we have a motion and a second, and please cast your vote. Motion is to deny the request for a general plan amendment, and the motion uh, is unanimously, uh, unanimous denial. Thank you. Moving to the next item. Uh, item uh, 26 on your agenda is uh, another uh, general plan initiation request. Uh, this one happens to be in the Poplar area, Poplar Cotton Center. Uh, the applicant is uh, uh, Michael Brown, and they're represented by uh, Marge Balsley of Schaefer & Associate, uh, who is present. Um, the uh, property is uh, about a 15-acre parcel uh, uh, containing a vineyard and a house and mobile home. Uh, the property is located within the urban uh, development boundary of the Poplar Cotton Center area and is subject to the Poplar Cotton Center Community Plan. Uh, the request before you is, uh, is a two-part request. First, a general plan amendment, which also consists of two parts. They were requesting a, a change from commercial to low density residential on a, about five and a half acres along the frontage of, uh, of um, what is that, Road 192? Uh, and then a second part is a change from rural residential to low density residential on about nine and a half acres uh, on the interior portion. They've also requested a zone change, but uh, as noted in the report, the, the zone change authorization isn't needed at this time because it's to see if it's within an urban development boundary and your interim policy wouldn't apply in this case. Um, here are the issues. Uh, just to summarize, the property is inside an urban development boundary. The um, nine and a half acres that was, a, um, that was shown as a, um, rural residential was originally low density residential when the original popular plan was adopted. That was changed uh, in 1997 or 98 to rural residential at the request of the owners of Track 162. And can you point that out? Uh, that's that area there, a fairly large lot area, about 30,000 square foot lots. Uh, they requested and the board agreed to change the popular plan to establish a uh, rural residential density in this area. Uh, not only for the tract itself, but for a buffer area around the tract to allow a, a transition in densities so you didn't have a, a higher density housing backing up immediately to these three quarter acre lots. Um, so I just would like to point that out to you that, that this issue, if this general plan amendment is allowed to proceed, this issue will have to be uh, uh, reopened with the residents of the tract. And the second issue is the loss of commercial areas. Uh, uh, along Road 192. Um, this is always an issue for these rural communities. Our community plans always try to designate a uh, sufficient amount of, uh, of uh, commercially designated land so that you have services in the communities so that you don't have to have inordinate amounts of traffic uh, going into the larger communities to receive services. So that issue would have to also be looked at. Um, and then finally, I think we noted that uh, when we were doing the research on this particular request, we discovered there was an inconsistency between plan and zoning. That needs to be corrected, so we would take care of that if this is authorized. Again, our recommendation is that you, uh, you go ahead and authorize the applicant to file for the general plan amendment. Uh, we're, we're doing that uh, primarily on the basis of the general plan update, which uh, encourages more efficient and higher density land uses within urban development boundaries. We think the edge issues with Track 162 can be worked out, uh, perhaps at a policy level, uh, within that process. 
And I would point out one other thing. Uh, there has been an interest in some of the residents of Track 162 in getting sewer services from the Poplar Community Services District. If this land is allowed to develop, that would be one easy way to get the truck lines moved up in that area. That's, that's all I have. Questions? Or you, you said that this piece of land here, so I'm, I've got it up on my GS, it's, it's plopped right down between two residential subdivisions right. here. That it would that it would be uh, it would have sewer services available to it. If it doesn't have it right now, but uh, it, uh, it it would have to provide sewer service. I think Marge Walsley probably already has some information on that. She's been talking to the district. Okay. Just please identify yourself and give. Understood. Your Marge Balsley, uh, R. L. Schaefer and Associates, 2904 West Main Street, Visalia. We are the agents for the applicant in this project. Um, the applicant acquired a will serve letter from the Poplar Community Services District June 1st of last year. We have until June 1st of this year to pay the connection fees and commence development or our will serve letter dies. We have the last 96 lot approval from the sewer district without major renovation to their sewer system. There are seven subdividers behind us waiting in line for those services should we not get this built. Uh, so we're in a hurry. Um, the will serve letter, as I said, is good until June of this year. I hope to be able to complete my, the staff report and everything and provide that to the county so that they can utilize that without wasting their time and uh, be able to get this fast-tracked through the Planning Commission. The um, Commercial across the frontage of the lot I don't believe is that significant in that all the commercial development or zoning that is along Road 192 is underutilized now. There are a lot of commercial buildings that have been um, um, converted to residential units, a lot of residences existing within that commercial, and we'd just like to see this uh, as an infill project and get the sewer services in there and get the subdivision done. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might, uh, Marge, I, again, I mean, one of the things I appreciate about this process is that we're not really dealing with the, we won't be deciding the project here today. We're, we're going to give you the question whether or not give you the opportunity to pursue the general plan amendment uh, to do the project, and then that will come back for the Planning Commission. And a lot of these things will be worked out in that process. Uh, you know, in my own mind, the commercial thing, there's more to it than just what you say. Uh, you know, if you're going to put housing there and that becomes a major road, then you've got issues of safety and noise, and so do you have to put in a block wall or something along there for the housing. Those are issues that can be worked out, I believe, and will and, be worked out in the process. And we have both a traffic survey and a noise survey being done right now. But, but for our purposes today, it is whether or not, and again, going back to the comment I made earlier, this is clearly the kind of case you're within the urban development boundary areas. Uh, your project has every you know, good opportunity of, and chance of being successful. And so our only goal here today is to see whether or not you meet that threshold, and I think uh, obviously this project does. So. Questions from the board? In a motion. Motion to approve applicant to move Thank forward you. the GPA. Moved and seconded. Uh, please cast your ballot. The board unanimously approved uh, the request for a general plan amendment. Moving to item 27, public comments. Uh, we have American Red Cross. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, basically, I'm going to make it short and sweet since we've been here a while. <laughs> um, basically, what I'm here to, to talk to you about is our Real Heroes event that we're going to be having um, on March 28th. Basically, what it is is we're going to be, um, we are currently accepting nominations for people that have um, done heroic acts. Um, saving people's lives, coming to the aid of uh, people. We currently have 16 nominations thus far, and we're hoping to get more because we have 12 categories. Um, our Hero Selection Committee, which is made up of about 19 uh, uh, community members in Kings and Tulare County, are going to be reviewing those in a few weeks. Um, I've read through the stories. Some of them are amazing. Um, it's to 
honor and um, salute a lot of the heroes within our communities that don't really feel that they actually are a hero, even though they are, because they have come to the aid of, of someone else. Um, also, too, is we're actively seeking sponsorships, table hosts, table sponsors, um, to help defray the costs of this event. Also, too, we're looking for donations also, too, because all of the, the monies that are donated are going to go to directly to our local chapter, which we cover in Tulare and Kings County. Um, I have some packets for you all if you'd like to take a look. So, and we're really excited also, too, because this is our first year ever doing it. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other comment, public comments? Yes, sir. Please state your name and your address. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Gomez, and I live at 2920 East Stewart Avenue in Visalia. Um, I, come, I come before you because of the respect and admiration that I have for a fellow HHSA employee. Um, his name is Mayin Karan. He, um, he was asked on Thursday to resign his position because this county chose not to sponsor his legal residency um, and so terminating his appointment with us. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I'm just uh, confused at why that happened and, you know, he's a great worker, does what he's supposed to, does it above, does above what he's supposed to. And it's, for the past year, it's just been a pleasure to work with him. And um, I, th I think he was owed at least, you know, an explanation as why his, his application was rejected. And um, that's out of respect for him that I'm here. And out of the 12 years that I've been with this county, I don't think I would do that for anyone but him. So thank you very much. Any further public comments? Seeing none, we'll move to uh, uh, Board of Supervisor Matters. We'll start with Mr. Ennis today. I had uh, the opportunity last Friday to go to the uh, Porterville City Fire Station training area where uh, they're testing uh, for the new county fire department. And the day I was there, we had 90 applicants and they had maybe 150, 160 total. But the quality, this was the physical training, the quality of these people was uh, unbelievable. All of them from other agencies, uh, other fire areas, different cities, some of them within the county cities, some without the county. But all these people trained people, very capable people, and it really excited me about uh, our new county fire department. I was very, uh, very glad to, to be there and be a part of it. Thank, Thank you. you. So did you participate by uh, going to the to, In fact, they wanted me and you and Alan to go out there, and even Connie. I think it was our CEO's office, and I said, I have a spelling B2B, and I can't <laughs> be there, which was true. Uh, but also, I'm healthy today because of that. And I, and I said enough, Mr. He, Chairman. I had nothing else to say. But the word you wanted spelled was no. <laughs> I would have gone Supervisor Zunis, but I didn't want the rest of you guys to feel bad. I got in trouble when I first got here for climbing a... Uh, 65 feet up into the air on we had a new fire engine down in early Martin I went down there and the fireman dared me and put suited up and I went and by the time I got back to the office supervisor Maples was waiting for me to tell me that was totally unacceptable behavior and what was I trying to do make the rest of them climb the, the fire engine so uh, I declined <laughs> well, I'm glad you did that uh, a couple things a few years ago I went out on a training exercise with the uh, city of Isaiah's fire they suited me up, gave me a hose, filled it full of water, uh, filled a building full of smoke, and put an axe in my left hand and the hose in my right hand and said, now crawl and, and see if you can't find this firefighter that's down. So it was a, a exhilarating experience. By the time we got out of the building, I think I'd lost 10 pounds of, of sweat. Uh, a couple things On more. second thought, maybe I will go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize to Supervisor Conway, knowing what we had uh, in front of us here in our closed session, I, I rushed in to uh, make a motion to approve the project in Poplar Cotton Center, that being in her district. No, it's not my district. Oh, it's my district. Well, those guys down there. Well, maybe I should have <laughs> let you do it. I just kind of rushed in there. I'm glad you did. Uh, last night, the city of Visalia uh, voted to approve a, uh, a twenty-five up to $25,000 amount to enhance a contract we have to uh, 
add the east downtown Visalia area into the, the study area for uh, possible locations for county um, facilities. I just wanted to make the board aware of that. That vote did take place last night. It was approved. I think Mr. Haddix will be working with them to uh, add that scope of work. Thank you. Supervisor Conway? Um, I think all I have is to mention once again the uh, the partnership is starting again. I appreciate both of you being there. Um, looking forward to good work with uh, the partnership moving forward. We had some seed. We'll be doing some seed grants to stimulate the economy in the eight Central Valley counties. And I'm very honored and proud to serve as chair this time rather than co-chair. Uh, it's like a second full-time job, but that's okay. <laughs> I have time on my hands. I was actually just forwarding an email. Uh, I probably don't have to now. My mother on Friday, she told me she wouldn't go, but evidently they're going to kidnap her. her. She's going to get her 40-year pin for working at Tulare District Hospital, where she still works full-time. Wow. That's really over a 45 or plus. She had some children, so she took some time off in between. So now you all know why I'm the <laughs> workaholic that I am. On that happy note, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My report's a little bit lengthier. Uh, I'm sorry that I am going to have to apologize to the public that I was not able to to put together the state of the county address. Uh, some of you know I not only have a day job, but I have a night job. <laughs> and that Reason night job Reason. started uh, approximately January 11th <laughs> and ended right before we went to Washington, D.C. My night job is starting wind machines as a farmer. Uh, so and thank goodness after this is the third freeze I've experienced as a farmer, and at least this time I had a day job. <laughs> so I'm very thankful for the fact I also have a day job. In the time before we left for Washington, D.C., we received resolutions from seven of our neighboring counties in support of a pilot program of from the federal government to, to start a pilot program to eradicate marijuana. These counties start from Stanislaus National Forest all the way down to the southern tip of the Sierra uh, National Forest. So that includes Yosemite and Sequoia National Parks. We were able to get those uh, Board of Supervisor resolutions and we presented them to the proper people in Washington, D.C., and this was what we quote is our invitation for them to come into our southern counties and start uh, a federal task force on eradicating marijuana. So that was another part of our trip to Washington, D.C., and I believe we were successful. Uh, I know for a fact last night I was informed Sequoia National Park received over a, mi a million two in additional funding for personnel. Uh, not all of it will be law enforcement, but I imagine close to half of it will be law enforcement. We have yet to find out what happened in the National Forest and the BLM, but I believe from the hints we had when we were in Washington that hopefully there was additional funding for this marijuana effort. The other endeavor we were involved in before we left <coughs> is we received resolutions from the eight incorporated cities of Tulare County on our efforts to seek mitigation for the loss of surface water from the current, excuse me, from the San Joaquin River settlement. And we presented those to our elected officials and to other agencies, which I believe were very effective along with the presence of the city people that we had, that uh, our electeds in the departments are taking a different look at the implementation legislation that was going forward. So uh, hopefully we were successful to, to uh, at least identify the needs for the mitigation and how that mitigation effort may be solved. Last of all, I will be traveling to Jackson on Wednesday for a Sierra Nevada Conservancy meeting. And in our last news bulletin, we have $17,500,000 available for grant money for this year. 
for projects in the areas east of the Blue Oak uh, tree line. So this includes 20, approximately 22 million acres of land that's covered. So if we have projects in our foothill areas in Tulare County, I would suggest that we start working on grant applications. We will be initiating uh, guidelines for the grant applications. So I want everyone to know this is time to get in line to receive some <laughs> of those grants. And other than that, uh, that ends my report. And <coughs> County Council, I believe that we have need for closed session. We do, Mr. Chairman. May I say, as the department head entrusted by your board to administer your workers' compensation program, I'm very supportive of none of you going through the uh, <laughs> fire, firefighters' training. Uh, thank you, and the workers' comp fund thanks you. Uh, we have items A through K on your board's um, closed session agenda. I do not anticipate any announcements. Thank you for attending.